Hey, 42 here. We humans can build some pretty spectacular things. Skyscrapers, monuments, and majestic feats of engineering just spring from the ground wherever we settle. It's as if we just can't help but shake a triumphant fist at the sky before marking our territory with another piece of architectural artwork. But did you know that the greatest architects and designers in the world don't necessarily work at a desk in a fancy office? To find them in their awe-inspiring projects, you might have to take a walk on the wild side. Here are seven amazing structures created by animals. In the remote and untamed wilderness area of Wood Buffalo National Park in Alberta, Canada, everyone's favourite semi-aquatic rodents have banded together to earn their very own world record. Since the mid-1970s, generations of beavers have spent their lives felling trees in preparation for their magnum opus, the world's biggest beaver dam. Not to be confused with the quaint little hamlet of Beaver Dam, Alberta, although I'm sure they have just as much to be proud of. This impressive structure was first discovered in 2007 thanks to researchers using Google Earth. Yes, the dam is so big it can be seen from space. Step aside, Great Wall of China. It wasn't until 2014 that an adventurous person made the journey to see it for themselves. Measuring a whopping 850 metres long, and formed from two different dams joined together, it's the length which earns it the title of the biggest in the world. Two beaver lodges house the industrious workers, offering a place for them to rest and celebrate their fine work. Although they're not interested in resting for very long, as the beavers continue developing the dam to this day building towards another dam under construction nearby, which will add between 50 and 100 metres to the dam's total length. Just like other enthusiastic record holders, they're looking to defend their title, and perhaps give some human-scale dams a run for their money. Busy as a beaver, indeed. Equally as renowned as a beaver for their work ethic, the lowly ant is capable of lifting objects over 10 times its own weight and building elaborate communities out of the very soil beneath you. We've all seen ant hills, the little mounds of dirt piled ankle high around the entrances and exits of ant colonies. But just how deep do they go exactly? In 2012, the largest known ant city was unearthed in the country of Brazil, covering an area of 500 square feet and plunging 26 feet beneath the surface. Based on best estimates, it is presumed that the ants move nearly 40 tonnes of soil while excavating the labyrinthine network of tunnels, chambers and other distinct structures. To put that weight into perspective, it will be the same as the ants shifting a humpback whale bit by bit to build their home. That's no small feat. When the ant city was discovered, the leafcutter ants who once called it home had long since abandoned it for greener pastures though they left behind telltale signs of how they organised their caste system to which they were bound. Within the colony were distinct rubbish heaps, where the refuse generated by the ants would have been gathered to be removed by designated garbage handlers. Gardens were dotted throughout for the cultivation of the edible fungus that the ants subsisted on. Besides major thoroughfares which cut through the heart of the colony, just like our highways, it's eerily similar to how human society must look from a bird's eye view, and it surely ranks as one of the most spectacular feats ants have ever accomplished. So the next time you've got a magnifying glass and you're feeling antsy, perhaps you should consider giving the little buggers a pass and find something else to burn. Not all termites live in the walls of suburban homes, though that might be hard to believe at first. They would chew their way through a tree just as soon as they cause structural damage to your house. But out in the wide open spaces of nature, some termites prefer a little extra shelter from the elements than just a layer of bark. Enter the termite mound, towering like a natural colossus of roads and filled to the brim with termite ingenuity and efficiency. Reaching heights of up to nine meters, the termites like to test the limits of their natural engineering talent. Though it's even more impressive when you consider that for an equivalent human building, it would be around two kilometers tall. That's the same as taking two of Saudi Arabia's one kilometer high kingdom tower and stacking them. Termites work together as a cohesive coordinated unit. 
Though they have no language or method of communication other than pheromones and basic physical interactions, they are able to sense something as simple as damage to the outer wall of the mound and within minutes begin to work together on repairs. If their entire mound were destroyed, it could be completely rebuilt by the colony within three months, all without words or blueprints. Being that talented at construction, you'd think that termites would be esteemed as patron saints of construction workers everywhere. But sadly, the stereotype of termites as vicious home destroyers lives on. To help control the temperature and allow airflow throughout the colony, ventilation shafts are built to draw in fresh air from the outside and the entire mound is formed to naturally circulate air. When combined with the insulation offered by the earth around the nest, the termites are able to maintain a pleasant temperature all year round, with remarkably little temperature variation. Just like the people of Kuba Pedi, Australia, these brilliant little insects must know the joys of living entirely underground. Just like ants, termites burrow into the soil. Termites, however, choose to build higher instead of deeper, creating monuments which will last at least until the elements or a malicious predator brings them down. Off the coast of Japan in the mid-90s, scuba divers discovered mysterious patterns in the silt and sand of the ocean floor. Scientists were completely baffled. There were no obvious explanations for the undersea crop circles that kept appearing, at least at first. They watched and waited for a decade, trying to catch the creator in the act, but they saw nothing. It wasn't until they decided to take note of the unassuming pufferfish that they finally had their culprit. No more than 12 centimeters long, the tiny pufferfish shaped curious circles on the sea floor up to two meters in diameter. Although no one is exactly certain why, the best guess of well-educated men and women is that the circles are used as a part of the mating ritual between male and female pufferfish. Instead of a metal ring, the male pufferfish carves a ring into the rapidly shifting sands beneath the surf, and proudly presents it on a bended fin to his beloved. Actually, that's rather romantic when you look at it that way. Female pufferfish lay their eggs in the fine sediment at the centre, before turning tail, leaving the males to guard the fertilised eggs for another six days afterwards. Counting the week or so it takes the male to make the damn thing, that means that they spend two weeks on something that the female uses only for a day or two at best. That's rough. The circles, while beautiful, are not actively maintained by the pufferfish and will wash away soon after their usefulness has ended. However, their design takes into account the constant ebb and flow of underwater currents, with fluid dynamics tests finding that the way they are shaped actually serves to slow down the currents as they near the center of the circle. This serves to ensure that the softest sand at the center, which is reserved for the eggs, lasts as long as it needs to, undisturbed by the undertow of the ocean. Each circle is a temporary and delicate work of art, which can hold back the sea itself, in order to provide the best conditions for the next generation of pufferfish. Pufferfish are, therefore, living proof that spectacular things can come from the smallest packages. In 2010, after an exceptionally intense monsoon season, northeastern Pakistan experienced widespread flooding that covered nearly one-fifth of its total land area. Many of the frontier provinces suffered as a result, with more than 20 million people displaced as a result of the surging floodwaters. But humans weren't the only ones driven from their homes. Seemingly overnight, the trees in flooded areas were completely cocooned in spider webs. Yep, that's right, spiders fled the waters as well, seeking the highest and driest places available to them. In short order, the foliage of eastern Pakistan took on the appearance of elaborately wrapped Egyptian mummies, and lots of people who didn't know that they suffered from arachnophobia figured it out pretty darn quickly. And so there were white frosted branches as far as the eye could see. Although it's not quite the hell on earth you might be imagining. The creepy crawlies spinning webs in the treetops may have actually provided a small measure of disaster relief for the stricken Pakistani people. Despite the vast new plot of standing and stagnant water, 
there is no complementary rise in malaria infections due to what should have been a booming mosquito population. The best guess is that the spiders were able to effectively control the mosquitoes and prevent them from running rampant across the saturated countryside. Not quite the evil eight-legged abominations you took them for, eh? Flooding in Pakistan continues to this day. So for now, the spiders continue to weave their spell over the region. There is some evidence that the webbing covering the leaves may be having a detrimental effect on the trees, but there simply aren't any volunteers to clear out the infestation. As long as they're keeping malaria-ridden mosquitoes at bay, I suspect the Pakistani people will continue to enforce a status quo between themselves and their brand new neighbours. It's a well-known fact that birds prefer to situate their nests up and away from prying eyes and thieving paws. Most are content to gather twigs together in a fork of the branches where they can settle down and perhaps lay an egg or two in relative obscurity. Not so for the Montezuma Orempindola birds of Central America, who prefer a flashier yet isolated lifestyle. The magnificent basket-like hanging nests of the Montezuma Orempindola are often seen in single trees set apart from the rest of the forest. The peculiar birds prefer solitary bases from which to hang their homes, often choosing trees near wasps' nests or other hazards so as to deter potential predators. They're the very poster child of introversion in the animal kingdom. You can almost hear them saying, I built a pretty awesome nest, but don't bother coming to see it. They thrive in the tropical climate around Nicaragua, northwestern Costa Rica, and parts of Panama and southern Mexico. Like most creatures native to the region, they have no qualms about putting on a display, as evidenced by their conspicuous nests and bright ruddy plumage. Look, but don't approach, is their creed. And if you prefer not to tango with wasps, you would be wise to heed their warning. North and east of Australia, just off the coast, lies the largest structure made by living organisms. It's far larger than the world's biggest beaver dam, and of course it's also visible from space. Yes, I'm talking about the Great Barrier Reef, one of the wonders of the natural world and home to countless types of fish and other assorted aquatic creatures. A gorgeous stretch of ocean which spans more than 344,000 square kilometres. It covers an area larger than the United Kingdom, Holland and Switzerland combined. It was officially recognised and protected as the Great Barrier Reef Park by the Australian government in 1975. With the protected status came strict rules and regulations against human interference, providing a unique shelter for migrating whales and endangered species like the dugong and the large green sea turtle. Thanks to the efforts of conservationists, the Great Barrier Reef is still a pristine refuge for thousands of ocean-dwelling species in a world where the oceans seem to grow more crowded with each passing decade. Though photographs and popular culture might have you believe that the entire reef is comprised of coral, in fact, only around 7% of it is actually made of this colourful reef builders. It is, however, the largest collection of coral in the world, giving it the distinction of also being the largest living structure, in a sense. Besides the coral reefs, other types of marine habitats like shallow seagrass fields share the space, besides algal and sponge gardens, just to name a few more. It's a flourishing ecosystem and a priceless investment for scientists and researchers who study our oceans to find better ways for us to coexist. Thanks for the view, subscribe for more 42.